a Republican newspaper, which has endorsed only Republicans for president, with the exception of, uh, of uh, 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 U.S. Grant, uh, 1872. Uh, uh, our founder, Joe Medill, one of the founders of the Republican Party, uh, didn't like Grant and uh, went with Horace Greeley, uh, another great newspaper publisher. Uh, and I point all this out uh, because uh, rather than uh, do the usual introduction, I'm just going to quote from the Chicago Tribune's endorsement of Barack Obama. Since taking his first step into elector in elective politics in 1996 when he joined the General Assembly, Obama has provided a refreshing antidote to a political culture that boils with insincerity, dogma, division, and ethical corner cutting. Hard to believe that of Illinois, but I hear Florida's taking lessons from us. But anyway, he has done so with the tongue of a statesman and the touch of a commoner. He inspires those who agree with him and earns respect from those who don't. Obama is a regular at a weekly poker club of state Senate colleagues, among them a Southern Illinois conservative, a Lake County Democrat, and a Northwest suburban Republican, not exactly the home team. Chief among his le legislative feats was his shrewd negotiation of a controversial measure to require that all police departments in Illinois electronically record interrogations and confessions in murder cases. That bill, designed to safeguard against false and coerced confessions, was a skunk for any lawmaker who didn't want to look like a cream puff on crime. And yet Obama took it on in 2003 and ferried proposed legislation for months among a half dozen interest groups before finally cutting a deal, making Illinois the first state to legislate electronic taping. Other states are beginning to follow suit. Obama has made a career of converting doubters into believers. There were the women at the alt Gale Gardens Public Housing Project who two decades ago didn't believe the fresh-faced community organizer who came calling could help them get their apartments inspected for asbestos contamination. There were the South and West Side ministers who told Obama when they first met him they didn't need any, quote, high-talking college-educated brothers like yourself, unquote, to help them solve community problems. People have been won over by Obama's sincerity and persistence. Quote, he conveys a sense of calm assurance, said Martha Minow, one of Obama's professors at Harvard Law School, where he was elected the first black president of the Harvard Law Review. Quote, there's an integrity that shines through, a sense of looking above the small and petty differences, unquote. Sometimes he's wrong, says the Chicago Tribune. We have disagreements with him and expect we'll have some more when he's in the Senate. He has more faith in big government solutions and less faith in free markets than we do. But attempts to portray Obama as a dogmatic, predictable liberal fall flat. It has been tremendously encouraging in this campaign to hear him speak of the need to change the intensely partisan tone of political rhetoric in this country, to say, uh, as he did in the National Democratic Convention, there's, no liberal, uh, there's not a liberal America and a conservative America. There is the United States of America. Obama is no latecomer to the themes struck in his brilliant keynote speech at the convention, which rocketed him into the national stratosphere. The expectation here, says the Tribune, is that Obama won't succumb to the pressures or get caught up in the celebrity. The expectation is that he will be an effective senator because he will listen to Illinoisans and to the voice that has gotten him this far, his own. Ladies and gentlemen, I have nothing to add to that except to say, show some love for Barack Obama. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, let, me, let me begin uh, by thanking uh, this wonderful foundation, uh, Frank Svoboda, for inviting me uh, to attend. Let me congratulate uh, Tony Off for uh, his outstanding award uh, and, and well-deserved. Uh, Clarence, thank you very much for the gracious in introduction. In fact, it was so gracious that uh, I'm going to sit down now. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't think I can top that or live up to it. But, uh, uh, but since I am uh, obligated, I think dinner is not ready yet, I will go ahead and keep on uh, with my speech. Uh, you know, it has been a pretty busy week for me, uh, and I, it is true that I've been getting 300 invitations a, a week to speak, so we decline a lot, but I figured that I better do my best to show up uh, here since I can't think of an easier target uh, for political cartoonists than a tall guy with big ears and a funny name. Um, in, in, in fact, one of the joys of this uh, political campaign was being subjected to my first few uh, political caricatures, um, which I enjoyed very much until my wife and six-year-old and three-year-old daughters grabbed uh, the picture from the paper and said, well, they, they didn't make the ears big enough. 
Um, <laughs> so so uh, my six-year-old immediately got to work drawing a more accurate portrayal uh, of me. Uh, as I said before, I, I, I want to congratulate this foundation for doing great charitable work uh, already uh, in the short time that uh, it's been here. Uh, every day that he touched a pen to paper, her block made a difference in this world. And I'm sure he's looking down with pride, knowing that every day that you walk into the foundation, you're doing uh, the same work. As I was preparing for this speech, I, I thought a lot about Herb Locke's philosophy on life that he would mention from time to time. As a cartoonist, Herb was always able to illustrate deeply held convictions about complicated political issues with a few brief strokes. And so it's not surprising then that uh, this simple, graceful, yet profoundly challenging philosophy that expressed itself through the pen uh, was passed down to him uh, from his parents. And he described it as, uh, as the following. Be a good citizen and think about the other guy. Be a good citizen and think about the other guy. And looking back on our history, at times that's been a lot harder than it sounds. But thanks to people like Herb Block, We've done a decent job in this country of trying to live up to that simple edict. And when we've succeeded, it's made America the place where dreams are possible, where freedoms of speech and press and worship are protected, and where the rising tide, if not lifting the boats of all, at least lifts the boats of the many and not just the few. That's the America that we love, the America we hope for. But that's not the America that we're going to have just by leaving this country on autopilot and going about our own business. The America that Herb Block loved so deeply takes work. It takes a belief that we're all connected as one people, that we rise and fall as one nation. It takes looking at squarely the 45 million Americans without health insurance, the one in five children born into poverty every day, the hundreds of thousands of veterans who don't get the care they need when they come home, despite the fact that we live in the wealthiest nation on earth and that we promise them such care. It requires us to say that the problems of these folks are our problems, all of us. And we have a responsibility to do something about them. And sometimes it takes a man or woman with a pen who's got the courage to draw these problems for the rest of us to see. Be a good citizen. Think about the other guy. Last week, I was in Illinois visiting college campuses all over the state. And I met some wonderful students during the recess week, good citizens themselves, who want to work hard for their own future and for the future of this country. And as I spoke to these students, they told me stories that collectively started to describe a certain theme, stories that should give us all pause. I heard them talking about how they were working 25, 35 hours a week on top of going to classes to help pay for their tuition. A lot of them aren't looking forward to graduation day with excitement, but rather with anxiety, because that'll be the first day of debt payments that could last a lifetime. There are even some of them who will get their tuition bill in the mail, open it, and make the heart-wrenching decision to not come back next semester. 220,000 young Americans gave up on their dream to go to college last year for the simple reason that they couldn't afford the price of tuition, which is now rising at a rate of almost 10 percent a year. Over the last 25 years, it's gone up an astounding 519 percent. Add to that the rising cost of health care, child care, falling family incomes, pension, benefits being eliminated, health care benefits being eliminated, and you get a picture of what these children and their parents are facing. The chance to go to college 
the chance to unlock so many doors of opportunity and possibility, that's been the essence of the American dream. It's a chance that was once provided to my grandfather and so many others returning from World War II by the GI Bill, which led to the creation of the world's largest middle class. It's the chance that once made my father, a young African's dreams come through, come true, when the University of Hawaii offered him a scholarship to study in America. It's a chance that was given to me by my parents, who weren't rich, but uh, recognize that in a ge generous America, you don't have to be rich to achieve your potential. It can be achieved through hard work and education. The essence of this country has been the notion, often observed, uh, not always, but often, uh, that we can, in fact, aspire as far as our dreams can take us. And the fact of the matter is, is that today, at the beginning of the 21st century, at a time when we know the high-wage, high-value jobs of tomorrow place a higher premium on a college education than ever before. Uh, those dreams are receding from the grasp of too many of our young people. More and more, Americans are competing for these jobs with highly educated workers from India, China, and all over the world. Uh, Tom Friedman, who many of you are familiar with, uh, is going to be coming out with a book called The World is Flat, and relates the story of visiting India, uh, Bangalore, uh, an area that is now the Silicon Valley of India, and discussing the fact that when he met with one of the uh, CEOs of one of the uh, upcoming uh, high-tech firms there, that this individual indicated they were going to be hiring 9,000 new computer software analysts over the next few years, and that this CEO had received one million applications from Indian students who were well qualified for these jobs. If we want America to win in this new global economy, we have to start sending more kids to college, not less. We have to open up more opportunities for our young people, not fewer. And so as I stood in these Illinois colleges, listening to students tell me about their problems, I started thinking, when did the cost of college stop becoming our collective problem? When did the headlines about skyrocketing tuition start getting crowded out by Michael Jackson and Martha Stewart? And when did this national priority start playing second fiddle to the latest partisan food fight in Washington? I'm not sure, but I do know that I've met enough good citizens who think about the other guy and want to change this. And I believe that there are enough members of both parties who want to start this country down the path of making college affordable and accessible for every American. Now, I look around this room tonight and feel both fortunate and hopeful that I'm in the company of folks who are already doing their part to get us there. When you announce the winner, Tony, uh, of this award, but also when you announce the winners of the first Herblock scholarships, you're not only fulfilling Herblock's wishes, but the dreams of children who just want the same chance to succeed. Uh, in Congress, I'm trying to do something about it. I believe it's time for Congress to follow your lead. So this week, I'm introducing something I call the HOPE Act, the Higher Education Opportunity Through Pell Grant Expansion Act, a bill that will make college more affordable for 430,000 Americans by increasing Pell Grant awards. Today, 5.3 million undergraduate students use these grants to fund their education but the awards just haven't kept up with rising prices of in, uh, tuition or even inflation. The HOPE Act would correct this problem. It's going to raise the Pell Grant maximums to $5,000 and index it to inflation, but the bill would also make sure that no see student sees a reduction in Pell Grant assistance due to recent changes in the eligibility formula that have been proposed by the administration.